Matthew 14. And before we stand for the reading of the word of the Lord, I want to tell you how the Lord assembled this message in my mind and heart, and I pray it ministers to you. Uh, interesting week, probably one of the hardest weeks I, I think I can remember uh, for quite some time. Um, the idea was to go to San Diego for the 4th of July for uh, some vacation time. And uh, the 4th fell on um, Tuesday. So we left Sunday night. And uh, we had arranged eight months ago for a hotel right across the street from my sister. So we'd had four rooms set. And um, my sister Nancy and her husband Harry lived just across the street from the hotel. So we had four nights. I brought all my family. And we came to Coronado for the 4th of July parade. If you've never been to Coronado for the 4th of July parade, uh, though I'm a city council member here, uh, we pale in comparison to how Coronado celebrates the 4th. It's a pretty amazing time. And we enjoyed some R&R &R there. Um, and while we were there, um, a dear, dear brother in the Lord, Harry Grotty, uh, Harry, a retired fireman, he and his wife Delia are, are members of our congregation. And Harry has been struggling with brain cancer for quite a while. You would see him over here to the, my left, your right. And every time I saw him, uh, and he was here two weeks ago, uh, he would always come up to me and say, I love you and I'm praying for you and your whole family. And he did. He prayed by name for every member of my family. He walked 25,000 homes for me, probably more in the course of four elections. Um, he is a servant. He, um, 39 years as a firefighter, I believe. Uh, unbelievable, or 29 years, I can't remember, long time fireman, um, a, a servant in the community and loved his wife and cared for her. And one of his good friends, Nick Ochoa, said, Rob, you need to go visit Harry. He's not doing well. Well, I, I could never tell, you know, how serious it was because he always looked so good to me and he was always just filled with joy. And um, so we head to San Diego and I get a call from Brett uh, that Harry's not doing well. He's been put on hospice. And so we cut our, our vacation a day early to get back in time so I could say goodbye to Harry. We got home about 1130 at night and I was thinking it's too late to call Delia. I don't want to disturb them and uh, I'll, I'll go in the morning. So I uh, wake up in the morning and I'm heading to Delia's house. I'd left her a message. She calls me en route and says, Rob, uh, Harry passed at 1 a.m. And I thought, I didn't get a chance to say goodbye to a man that, that lived his whole life to make mine easy. He was a servant. And, and it occurred to me that Harry would have been upset that I took a, a day off of a vacation to come say goodbye. Because he would never have wanted that. That's the kind of man he was. And um, I miss him. And, and as I came back to that, my phone lit up. And some of the most intense counseling sessions I think I've ever participated with people before, and I can't go into detail for the sake of anonymity, but suffice it to say, if a pastor faces one of these in the course of, of, of a pastoral ministry, it's pretty intense, let alone three major issues in the course of a week. And while we were there, my sister Gretchen, who... Um, um, by her own admission, a, a lesbian, uh, a life partner of 19 years. Her life partner, Mo, took her last name. We all in the family had assumed they had gotten married. And, uh, and when she had given her heart to the Lord, I know that, you know, she's got conflicting areas. And she had had a torn aorta, or, yeah, torn aorta, and, and she almost died. Uh, it was congenital. Um, my maternal grandmother died at 48, and, and my, my sister had the same issue. And I was thinking it was almost interesting that it was, you know, her heart is torn uh, between her, her two lives. Um, and and um, so we were there and we were thrilled and, and the kids hugged her and many were crying as they were so excited to have their Aunt Gretch still living. And she was recovering and we were with her that in the course of that time. And in passing, they, they said, uh, Mo and Gretchen were there. We went to visit them at their house one day. And in passing, they said, we're we're going to get married on Thursday at the Justice of the Peace. And I, I know that Gretchen's gone back and forth. And again, we had assumed it, but the, the comment was for the sake of Social Security. And all of us said, do you want us there? 
do you want us to be there? And however you're going to judge that, the Lord is, you know, there's, there's ways to work into to a, a life. And I want to minister to my sister. And, and so as I'm, I'm contemplating that, we, we said on countless occasions, do you want us there? And Mo uh, clearly said, no, no nobody's going to be there. Okay. So we went home, um, and, and many counseling sessions ensued, and, and the calls that were coming in. And I, I remember that day I, uh, that I returned, it was almost 80 texts I had received in the course of that day, and it was just absolute insanity. Um, medical issues with uh, all kinds of stuff, let alone, you know, just my burden for Harry. And in the midst of all of it, the Lord gives me a word, and I don't get words from the Lord. He gave me a very clear word for Don McClure, who heads up the Calvary Chapel Association. I haven't talked to Don in months, and the, and the Lord said, you got to call him. And, and I called him to tell him the word the Lord had given me, and that was, you know, a burden. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't rest until I called him with this. And, um, and then this, this email comes from my sister, um, and, and I, I'd gotten a, a call from a friend who said, hey, let's go fishing. And I thought, where? And he said, out to the islands, uh, the Channel Islands, and your cell phone doesn't work. I said, yes. <laughs> yes. He said, meet me here Friday afternoon at the dock. And I brought my son-in-law, and uh, the four of us went out to the islands. And about 6 o'clock, the phone went dead, and it was just glorious. And we were out there till uh, Sunday night. I got burned. I'm wearing sandals because my feet hurt. <laughs> well, I'm teaching about loaves and fishes, and I thought this was, uh, no, <laughs> Jesus taught in sandals. Um, and, and, and the one email I got was from my sister, and it was blanketed to every grandchild. It was blanketed to every sibling. It was blanketed to the entirety of the family. And by the way, uh, Mo, as my children call her, Aunt Mo, uh, she refused to come to my daughter Kelly's wedding. She said, I, I don't want to be in a room with bigots and, you know. Um, and, and, and it broke my daughter's heart. I mean, just broke her heart. My sister Gretchen came, but Mo wouldn't come. So I found this letter blanketed to the family fascinating. Hello, family. I wanted to take a moment to let you know that Mo and I are officially getting married today after 19 years of being together. It's one of the most important days of my life, and I'm so happy to be able to legally acknowledge my love and devotion to Mo now and forever. I found myself tearing up this morning, thinking how happy and joyful I am to share my life with Mo, but also realizing that most of my family members are not supportive of our same-sex mar same marriage for religious reasons. A simple congratulations, or we are so happy for you, never was conveyed by any of my siblings, just silence. How that hurts me deep down inside. I would never want any of you to feel the way I feel right now. <clears throat> it dawned on me, <clears throat> excuse me, it dawned on me how hurt I was not to get that support from family when Mo and I were at breakfast this morning and during the course of breakfast, Mo mentioned to our waitress, Kathy, that we were getting married today. Kathy's response was so touching. Uh, she was so excited for us, and I started crying because I was so moved by her reaction to our special day. She also arranged for a fruit plate, pictured below, to be sent to our table and had arranged with her manager for our breakfast to be complimentary. It was this kind gesture and non-judgment of a non-family member that made my day today. I will never forget this random act of kindness from a stranger. I have so much love and respect for our family members, and I hope I show each of and every one of you, what unconditional love looks like. I'm crying as I write this, and I want to share this with you, so maybe next time if a family member is in love with someone, no matter what the race, color, sexual orientation, or eye color, we can be more supportive of them as a family and better show that generosity of spirit that is our family brand. Love is love. Now, it's a nice letter, but it made me angry. And I responded, and I said, you know, that's not fair, and it's very unkind. I said, we offered on a number of occasions to go. We never received an invitation, and yet you were setting us up. Yeah. You wanted to use this as an issue, and you want to talk about unconditional love. Unconditional love is the fact that we're there, regardless of how we may feel and the convictions we have. It's you who has attacked us, and I was, I was hurt by it, and I said, we'll talk later. And I was on the boat ride out when she called, and I said, I, I can barely hear you, 1,400 horsepower engines. I said, I'll have to call you when I get back. And she said, we're all good. And I said, um, I don't think so. 
And I said, but I'll call you later, and I do love you. And I hung up, and she said goodbye. When I got back, actually prior to leaving, one of my nephews came to spend time with my two boys. Uh, he's my, my older brother's youngest son. His name's Roy Diego. He goes to University of Kentucky. He's in nursing school. And uh, I sat down with him, and I said, Roy, how's this affecting you? You're one of the people who got blanketed with this. He said, you know, I don't know. I just, I just don't want conflict, and let them do what they want to do. And I, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I'm not really, and he's a typical millennial. I just, I, you know, I don't really know all the issues. I don't really want to know all the issues. I just don't want any conflict. I just kind of want to, you know. And, and I get that. And I, I said, I said, Roy, do you understand autonomy, theonomy, heteronomy, which we studied last week? He's like, no. <laughs> I said, let me walk you through it and tell you what's taking place that can't be put forward in a letter that's blanketed to the family. And I laid it out. And I said, and this is our position. And I said, in addition, what you don't know about the letter that we've never blanketed is that Mo didn't come to Kelly's wedding and labeled us as bigots. And, and we speak of unconditional love. Right. And, and I, I said, this is an issue where we're contending for society. Well, I'm not really into politics and all that. I said, okay. I said, he goes, I like America and, and his mother, my sister-in-law is from Guatemala. He goes, I've been to Guatemala. I see the contrast between America and the U.S. I love America. I, I see the problems in Guatemala, but I also see the decline. I'm, I'm grateful for America. I'm grateful for the opportunities. I said, well, do you want to, you know, the Bible says that a righteous man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Do you want that for your future? Because it's only going to be there for your children and your grandchildren if you contend for it and fight for it. But you just seem to want to take it and not give back. And, and this, this is a microcosmic picture of what we're contending for. And you don't have the answers and you don't understand the, the debate. and You don't understand what we're contending for. And, and, and to define the terms and what unconditional love is and, and, and what are the foundations of each person's philosophy and where does it come from? And, 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 you know, they use all these terms of Christianity, but they reject it. So let's have that conversation. We did for about 10, 15 minutes. He goes, wow, I never even thought of it that way. And it, it had this profound effect on him. Here's a young 20 year old millennial and he's just, he's floored by it. He goes, I've never even thought of that. He goes, I feel bad now. I go, why is that? And he goes, well, I sent a letter to Gretch. And she asked me for permission to send it to the family. And I'm, I'm like, well, it's personal to you, Gretch. And I guess if it makes you feel better, because he's, you know, young, he doesn't. And so, you know, Gretchen sent out his letter. And his letter, prior to our conversation, reflected what a millennial would reflect. Until after we had the conversation, he's like, there's a whole different side I haven't even investigated. His original letter, uh, Gretchen said, hello again, just wanted to share with you the text that we received from Roy Diego uh, on Gretchen, Aunt Mo. I just got off the phone with Rachel and she informed me that you two are now officially married. I want to say congratulations, wish you both a very, very, very happy and blessed wedding day. I apologize for not sending this sooner, but I was unaware of what was going on. I know that some of the members of our family may have hard time with your decision, but I want you both to know how much I utterly love, adore, support you, and indescribably grateful I'm to have the two of the most beautiful, strong, amazing women as my aunts. He goes on and on and on. And from his perspective, it, you know, he, he meant what he said. He just didn't know all the details. He said, and having sat with you, I see a perspective I've never considered. And I said, don't think for a minute that I, I don't love your aunt, my sister. But we're contending for an ideology of how we will be governed. And he goes, well, politicians are so... And I said, well, it, are you to blame for bad politicians? No. I said, yes, you are. You don't participate. You, you can't say that I don't want to do something and then decry the decline. Right. I said, you, you enjoy receiving from all of the structure you have, but you're doing nothing to build it. And it, it clicked with him. And he understood it. It didn't take much time. But it's bigger than just a letter trying to divide a family. I would never attempt to divide the family. That's not my heart. And I know each and every one of you have that struggle in your own home. You have things that you have to present and go forward with, but the question is, does God have the right to rule on the earth? And are his commandments 
to be dismissed or to be applied? Are we in submission to him? Autonomy either is going to end up in heteronomy or it's going to end up in theonomy. Theonomy is God's law. Heteronomy is another of the same kind. Autonomy is self-rule. What you're filled with is what you're governed by. So what kind of a world are you going to leave? And we've already covered <clears throat> as divorce and, and all the rules that have been made. And we've watched divorce and we see the, the imprint and the struggles. And everybody's dealing with something because of the decline of Western civilization. And, and all of us have been warped and we've got struggles and we've got issues and no doubt. And I've been dealing with that in these counseling sessions this week. Trust me. And, and this is, th these are folks that the last person you would ever thought would be struggling with what we're dealing with. So I, I know the room is inundated with struggle. But the question is, does God have the right to rule in our lives and in society so that this doesn't happen? And when I say this, I'm talking about the counseling sessions. And what role do we play? Or do we look at it and say, oh, the, the mess is too big, I can't do anything. Do we do a millennial approach and say, yeah. <clears throat> and, and, and yet in the midst of it, I can't tell you how tired I was and how overwhelming it was. And all I want to do is get on that fishing boat. And that brings us to the story today. So please stand for the reading of the word of the Lord. <laughs> We're going to pick up at verse 13. And it begins when, when Jesus heard it. And by the way, let me just put that into context. When Jesus heard it, when he had heard that John the Baptist had been beheaded by Herodias and Herod for the sake of standing and contending against civil authority for immoral behavior, Jesus' heart was broken. He was sad. Sad, similar to Harry Grotty passing. Something that just hits you in, in, the, in the core when he heard it. What was his initial response? He departed from there by a boat to the Channel Islands. <laughs> <clears throat> to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place and the hour is already late. So night is falling, it's about 6 p.m. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves some food. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fishes. They had the uh, Long John Silver Happy Meal. <clears throat> <laughs> and he said to them, bring them here to me. And then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fishes and looked up, looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments that remained. And now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. So we're talking about maybe 10 to 15,000 people were fed that day by five loaves and two fishes. Let's see what the Lord has to say to us. Let's ask him. Lord... We thank you that this is your living word. And Lord, you have the great ability and power to cause us to come alive to your living word. And Lord, I pray that we'd be forever changed as we would examine our lives before your living word. That we wouldn't just hear it, but we would apply it. We would live it. We would do it. And that we wouldn't just be hearers of the word, but doers. And from this passage, Lord, I pray that you would inspire and touch, bless and transform in accordance with your riches in Christ, in Jesus' name, amen. Please have a seat. <clears throat> Can we show the first slide, just the first one? Um, there it is, right there. Isn't that amazing? So you got um, the, the loaves and the fishes. The loaves were barley loaves, and the fish were dried fish, tiny, that almost sardine or mackerel size. Um, and barley was the poor man's food. And these weren't loaves. They were small cakes. I don't even think that's the best description. It almost looks like pita bread. They would be even smaller, almost like a <clears throat> English muffin. Uh, but it would be a, an, an Israeli muffin. <clears throat> and let's go to the next slide. Now here you see what is not an account in Matthew's gospel. <clears throat> But fascinatingly enough, 
This, other than the resurrection, is the only story for the most part that is covered in its entirety in all four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The feeding of the 5,000 with two loaves and, or five loaves and two fishes. And we don't realize that it's a young lad, the scripture says, which is, you know, in his teens, 13 or younger, a young lad who brought this to, uh, and it was Andrew who knew of this young lad. And, and this, this little boy came up and said, uh, I've got water. This young boy, it's just a frog, I don't know what to do with it. <clears throat> this young boy came up and said, um, you know, I got these. And, and let, me, let me give you that account, um, if I can find it. Here it is. Uh, it's John chapter 6, verse 8. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? And, uh, and it's interesting that verse 10 of that passage says, And Jesus said, Make the people sit down. And now there was so much grass in the place, so they, the men sat down in numbers of 5,000. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them. Now, the reason why there's grass is because John points out that it's during the Passover. It's in the spring. Now, when it says a deserted place, it doesn't mean they're in the desert. They're around the shores of Galilee. We're going to see this in November. And, and in the shores of Galilee, it's, it's pasture land. And the hills are the same as they were when Jesus walked. There's just a few uh, lighted communities, but you can stand on the shores of Galilee and almost go back in time because there hasn't been development around the Sea of Galilee. And it's, it's fascinating. And, and uh, they're in a deserted place, meaning at the time there weren't cities nearby because Jesus just wanted to get away and he got in the boat. Now, uh, the Sea of Galilee is 15 miles by nine miles and you can see from shore to shore wherever you are on the Sea of Galilee. You can see where it is. So when Jesus gets in the boat, to go away and just get away, everyone's like, there's his boat, there's his boat, let's go. And everyone in the city, they just start running after him. 10,000, 15,000 people are watching the boat. No, there's two, well, I've lost him. Oh, there it is, there it is. Just, and they're watching and Jesus, you know, they're all rowing and sailing or whatever is going. And he's thinking, the minute I get to shore, my phone's gonna light up with texts. <laughs> but he's out of cell range. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? And they're just waiting for him to come so they can put on their suction cups and drain him. <laughs> I need Dr. Marvin. I need. You never saw that? What about Bob? <laughs> yeah. And, and they're running and he can see the multitude. And he knows what's awaiting when he gets there. And he gets there and boom. And he, his heart's broken because his cousin... John the Baptist was beheaded. The one who had made straight the way of the Lord, the one who had baptized him, the one he had a love for, the one whose, he, his aunt was, you know, his great aunt was his mother and he was touched by, and all these things. And the first woman, his, John the Baptist's mother was the first woman to encourage his mother, Mary, when, when Mary was pregnant. And John leapt in the womb when, when Mary came into the presence of Elizabeth and the babies leapt in the womb. They'd had this connection since they were children and his heart's broken. And he's got all the concerns and, and, and he's just, he just, he's hurting. You know, you just go through life and enough is enough. Can I get an amen? amen? And yet there's all these people that need something from him. They need something from him. He's, he's, he's the manufacturer. He's got what it is they need. And that boat lands and whoosh. I've got this, I've got that, help me with this, please. I don't know, they're pushing in and, and the disciples are pushing him back and just trying to give him room to breathe. And everybody wants to touch his garment. Everybody wants to touch his head and everyone, something, do something for me. And it's, it's here that he, the other gospel account says he began to teach and he actually used it as a, a teaching lesson. The Father gave him a word for the people. The, the Lord gave me a word in a sense for Don McClure in the midst of all of it. It's like, I don't have time to call that guy. And it's weird how the Lord operates, but, but here he begins to use the opportunity as a teaching opportunity. And then the sun begins to go down. The disciples are looking and they're thinking, all these people are gonna be hungry. We're gonna have a riot on our hands and we don't have any money. And, and one of the disciples comes to Jesus and says, what is, what is 200 denarii amongst so many? 
He'd actually gone over to, to Judas, who was the one who kept the money bag. And Judas, how much money do we have? Uh, 200 denarii. He's thinking to himself, strange, I thought there was more, but okay. Um, <laughs> read your gospel, you'll know the joke. If you, if you don't. And, and, and he's, they're thinking there's, there's not enough to feed all these people. There's 10, 15,000 people. And, he, and, and, and they're, they're baffled. And then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, says, well, I, we got this lad here. And it's, you can almost see Andrew going, we got, we got this. <laughs> but again, what is that among so many? <laughs> what was I thinking? You know, two, two fish and five loaves to 15,000 people. <laughs> I was just kidding. I was just kidding. <laughs> but the little boy is like, look what I got. Now let's take a look at the little boy. The little boy's mama, he said, Mommy, I'm going to go follow Jesus today. Okay, you're going to need a lunch. Mama did her work that day. She packed her little boy's lunch. And she said, you're probably going to want to feed somebody in addition to yourself. And it may be a long journey. And I want you to spend time with Jesus. So here are five loaves and two fishes. Thanks, Mom. And stay with your uncle so-and-so or follow your older brother, whatever it is. But he's got his little Long John Silver Happy Meal. Because <laughs> mama took care of him. Mama took care of him. And that's the structure of the family. And this little boy brings what he has. And he says, look what I got. And he lays it out. And Andrew brings him to Jesus, compelled to do it, not knowing why, and actually feels like an idiot having done it. And the disciples, when Jesus, they said, there's so many, send them away. Jesus says, no, you feed them. And they're thinking to themselves, there's no way we're going to be able to feed them. And Jesus said, have them get in groups of hundreds and fifties, which reminds me of Exodus 18, 21, that, that he said, assign godly men who love the truth and are not given to covetousness over tens, fifties, hundreds, and thousands. Remember, we covered that in local, county, state, federal. And that's where our founders got that idea. So they're, they're over 50s and hundreds, and they're breaking them into groups. And you can imagine, and they want to create aisleways. And as John pointed out, there were aisleways, and they were sitting on the grass. And the word for sitting means they were reclining, which is what you do when you're ready to eat. So they're thinking, oh, we're going to get fed. And they're all laying down in the lovely grass. It's springtime. It's beautiful. It's probably very lovely weather. It was a magical day at the Channel Islands. And you can imagine just, you guys are boiling. <laughs> Great time. And we're out there. <laughs> caught nothing, by the way. Oh, I did. We caught barracuda and one halibut that as we went to get it, it the hook came in. Anyways, <laughs> it was like, it was huge. <laughs> Biggest fish I've ever seen. Uh, but that for another time. And it's going to get bigger. Uh, <laughs> But they're sitting in these groups and they're thinking to themselves, we're going to get fed. But they're looking around, where are the trucks, where are the wagons, where are the whatever? And where are the tables and the banquet table? And how are we going to feed this many people? And as they're gathering, you can imagine this, well, I want to sit with my family. Well, I don't want to be with him. I don't want to sit with there. And just the organization of that, the structure of that. So they're, they're having to structure to prepare blessing. And they're laying out organization, they're laying out authority, they're putting them in groups of 50, they're putting them in groups of 100, they're creating aisleways, they're setting them up, everybody's prepared, they have to organize families, they have to organize by, they gotta make sure the kids aren't separated from their parents, they're doing all of this, and everybody's got their opinion, and you're trying, and if you've ever tried to work with a group, it's like trying to herd cats. Yeah? And so the disciples are learning organizational ability to reach the masses, and they lay them down, and put them in groups, and they're all waiting, and they come back and they go, uh, <laughs> what now? I mean, we did what you asked. And, and they're saying, we only have 200 denarii. There's no way we can feed the multitude. You told us to give them something to eat. We don't have anything. Andrew goes, well, I got this. This little boy brought it. And then he thinks to himself, but what is this among so many? And I just want to talk to you about the power of one. Especially millennials. Because you don't think you can make a difference. And you've given up. And you're apathetic and you're used to receiving but not giving. And you got your little happy meal that mom put together for you. And you're always used to getting. Now it's time to give. It's not time to change the world. And I want to talk to the older folks who've given up. Show the next picture, would you? You've heard this story a thousand times from me. A thousand times. 
The little grandson walking on the beach after a massive storm and hundreds of thousands, millions of starfish have come up after the hurricane and the storm has receded and the clouds have dispersed and the sun is out and they're all dying. And the little boy begins to throw back the starfish one by one and the grandpa says, what are you doing? He says, I'm, I'm trying to save them. They're going to die. They can't get back to the water. And the grandpa says, there's too many of them. You'll never make a difference. What is this among so many? You'll never make a difference. Your, your older intellectual mind, and, and you've given up with apathy, and you're tired of fighting. And the millennials, they, they, have, they have youth, but no passion. You had passion, but you have no youth anymore. Somewhere in there, we've got to unite these two and change this world. Amen. And that little boy says, but grandpa, I'm making a difference for this one. And I'm making a difference for this one. And I've got five loaves and two fishes. At which point the grandpa begins to join him and the work output is now exponentially increased. And the idea is, quit looking at the horizon and the massiveness of it. Just do what you can. Amen. And others will join you. Let's pause it there. Do we have that video? And we'll come back to this slide. I want to show you this video. It's called, How to Make a Movement. So ladies and gentlemen, at TED we talk a lot about leadership and how to make a movement. So let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons from it. First, of course you know, a leader needs the guts to stand out and be ridiculed. <laughs> But what he's doing is so easy to follow. So here's his first follower with a crucial role. He's going to show everyone else how to follow. Now notice that the leader embraces him as an equal. So now it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Now there he is calling to his friends. Now if you notice that the first follower is actually an underestimated form of leadership in itself. It takes guts to stand out like that. The first follower is what transforms a lone nut into a leader. <laughs> And here comes a second follower. Now it's not a lone nut, it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. So a movement must be public. It's important to show not just the leader, but the followers, because you find that new followers emulate the followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people and immediately after, three more people. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point. Now we've got a movement. <laughs> so. Notice that as more people join in, it's less risky. So those that were sitting on the fence before now have no reason not to. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, but they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. So <laughs> over the next minute, you'll see all of the, uh, those that prefer to stick with the crowd because eventually they would be ridiculed for not joining in. And that's how you make a movement. But let's recap some lessons from this. So first, if you are the type, like the shirtless dancing guy, that is standing alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals. So it's clearly about the movement, not you. <laughs> okay, but we might have missed the real lesson here. The biggest lesson, if you noticed, did you catch it? Is that leadership is over glorified. That yes, it was the shirtless guy was first and he'll get all the credit, but it was really the first follower that transformed the lone nut into a leader. So as we're told that we should all be leaders, that would be really ineffective. If you really care about starting a movement, have the courage to follow and show others how to follow. And when you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first one to stand up and join in. And what a perfect place to do that, Ted. Thanks. <laughs> In 2014, when I decided to run for the state assembly, I was a nut. Nick Ochoa, Harry Grotti, Tom Hunt, Ron Gerber, myriad of others, Brett. Brett had no clue. He, he just said, Rob, I don't get it, but I'll serve you. It made no sense to him. And he, you talk about that lone nut and, and their... And, and you nurture the, the original followers. The reality is, I'm not the leader they were. They saw something that I couldn't see. Harry poured his life into walking precincts to the point where Nick would tell him, you gotta sit down. Riddle with, with cancer. 
He kept doing it even through the last council raise. I didn't even make it for his passing. And Delia said, Harry knew how busy you were. And I said, you know whose fault that is, Delia? It's Harry's. He got me elected. <laughs> the word that God gave me for Don McClure is that CGN and CCA, Calvary Chapel Association, the Calvary Global Network have split. CGN is being run by Brian Broderson, Chuck's son-in-law, and the family is involved in this. And then CCA is all the original pastors that started Calvary Chapel. And they've only lost like nine churches. And CGN's struggling. And Don oversees CCA. And I said, Don, I said, I served you as a pastor. And you were one of the toughest men I ever had to work for. But I love you as a son loves a father. And he says, and I love you as a father loves a son. I said, you say that, Don, and I believe you. But I have one question for you. Actually, two. When's my birthday? I don't know. When's my anniversary? I don't know. Do you know the anniversaries of Mike, and Don Jr., and Marcus? And you know their birthdays? Yes. And you know all your grandkids' birthdays? Yes. You don't know mine. Don, I know you love me, and I know there's anything you wouldn't do for me, but I'm not your son. I'm your servant. And God gave me a supernatural love for you, just like he gave a supernatural love to you for Chuck. Chuck was the hardest man you ever had to work for. He told me war stories about Chuck. Chuck would try to starve you out of ministry, and Don loved him. Don gave up a ministry to go and help Chuck transition because Chuck wanted to turn over to him. Chuck changed his mind and left Don hanging in the wind. <clears throat> and also John Corson. I can tell you story after story. And I don't know Brett's birthday. I don't know his anniversary. I don't know Harry's birthday. I don't know his anniversary. But I do know this. They love me. I love them. They're servants. God called them to that. They can put up with my idiosyncrasies and my motion changes, and they still put up with it. And I said, Don, the word the Lord gave me is the difference between CCA and CGN is CCA is the servants and CGN is the family. You see, family, servants choose to serve. And then God gives them a supernatural ability to do that. Family doesn't get a choice. And Chuck sacrificed in many sense his family for the ministry. And they were all scarred. I said, be tender with, them, with the changes. These folks are hurting. And he got it. And I, I, I was shocked that it came out of my mouth. And all that through this process of Harry and so many other things. And this movement started because there was a guy, what was his name? He, he wrote second. Um, the, the Marine Corps guy that was Chuck's assistant pastor. Uh, oh, Romaine. Romaine. I was going to say Ro, Ro, Romaine. I don't even know his name. Romaine would serve Chuck and his wife was dying of cancer and Chuck didn't even know his wife was dying of cancer. He said, uh, Chuck, I need to take a day off. What for? I'm going to my wife's funeral. Chuck was stunned. Nobody knows Romaine, but Chuck wouldn't be who he was without Romaine. Nobody knows that little boy's name, but this is in all four Gospels. It's one person surrendering their life for the sake of the Lord to transform a world. You guys know R.C. Chapman? Charles Spurgeon said he's the saintliest man I ever knew. He was a man who gave up a very expensive law practice in England from a very wealthy family to move into the poorest part of England and to minister, and he unified the churches through one of the most compassionate moves of God's spirit and, and absolutely inspired a man by the name of George Mueller. You guys know Spurgeon, you know Mueller. Let's go to the next slide if we could. <clears throat> There's George Mueller. He clothed and sheltered and educated 10,000 orphans with ever, without ever asking for a shilling. He did it by faith. He spent all of his time in prayer. Go to the next slide if you would. Faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There is no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. 
We're so impressed with our money. But where are the servants? And Jesus said, bring them here to me. This little boy said, I have this. He didn't look at the immensity of the problem and think that he couldn't make a difference. That's faith. Now, there's faith and there's obedience, and there's a very fine line as to where that moves, but both work well. <clears throat> little boy was faithful, and he was also obedient. Apathy is not faith. Apathy is not obedience. Disillusion is not faith. Disillusion is not obedience. It doesn't change anything. You're just part of the problem. The power of one, it's a movement. And they're servants. You know why I could minister to my sister? You know why I could endure that day I had? Because that man and everybody else on staff carried the weight. Because that man back there visited Harry and loved on him in my absence. We're together in this. Put them in fifties, put them in hundreds. Bring me what you have, bring it to me. You see, Jesus is the producer. We're the distributor. And if we don't move and we don't do something, we're part of the problem. Feed me instead of I want to feed others. I want to be a distributor. I want to be active in the kingdom of God. I want to be a servant. And I was thinking about those disciples. The, the passage says that they ate so much, the people ate so much that they were gluttoned. They ate as much as they wanted. It was like, you have to loosen the belt. Thank God we're wearing a robe. And they were just, <laughs> I, I can't even swallow this last bite. I can just move it around in my mouth. I'm not just satiated. I am saturated on the verge of nauseated. I've eaten so much. And they had to go and pick it all up because it was Jewish custom. And you don't pick up the half-eaten stuff. You pick up the whole stuff. And they had 12 basketfuls. Every disciple's walking back with a basket going, this is phenomenal. And it was at night. And you can imagine Jesus. He takes these things and he gives thanks. And you know what the thanks was? First, thanks to the Father. And thank you for this little boy. Thank you for the servants. Thank you for the distributors. Let them not grow weary in well-doing. And he gave thanks and he broke it and just started to multiply. DNA was being created. Matter was being, for just brawl. And they're watching it. And, they, and you know what it's like to feed 15,000 people? They're exhausted. They're tired. And they've got their own family issues too. In addition to everyone else, it's not just food they're passing out. Everybody wants to have a connection with Jesus. And they're all wanting to bend the ear. And they're all wanting connection. And they're tired. And the masses are gluttoned. And they're just lying there. Full, fat, and happy. And the disciples, their bodies are worn. But their hearts are rested. I'm still a little tired. I may be physically worn, but my heart is so full. It's not about being fat and happy. It's about having a tired body and a rested heart. Contending for what is right and never growing weary in well-doing. Let's go to the next slide. He who accepts evil without protesting against it is really cooperating with it, Martin Luther King Jr. He stepped into the fray of it all, the power of one. Ridiculed by pastors all throughout the South. Was he a perfect man? No way. But he was a willing man. He probably wasn't able, but he was willing. You know, God can take flawed creatures which happens to represent the entirety of the room. <laughs> he can take really wretched sinners, which happens to represent the entirety of the room. And he can use them as distributors. You receive it and you give it. He would break it, give it to them, and they give it away. And when you sign up, you're going to be exhausted. But your heart's going to be full. Martin Luther King Jr. is an enormous example. 
And I, I'm blessed by that. You know, the disciples said, send them away. It's like, I don't, I don't want this issue. Jesus goes, you're not the B-apostles, you're the A-apostles. <laughs> this, this is you. I'm teaching you to trust me as I trust the Father. This is the house of faith. You're going to witness things. You're going to have a tired body but a full heart. You're going to be blown away. You're going to be like George Mueller. You're going to be like R.C. Chapman. You're going to be like these folks that witnessed absolute miracles. Look at that. That is the reflecting pool. It was absolutely packed. They say crowds, and that's not even the beginning. That's at the con conclusion. They said the crowds have never been bigger in Washington than they were with Martin Luther King Jr. However you feel about him. And by the way, you, you, you can decry that, but I have a question for you. Have you ever been used like that? It's easy to be critical while you're gluttoned and happy. But he had death threats and then was ultimately killed. Go to the next one, please. Anybody know her? Nominated in 2007 for a Nobel Peace Prize. Al Gore got it. She didn't. Irena Sendler. Her heroic actions were forgotten by most of the world until 2000, when four girls at Uniontown High School in Kansas decided to research her life as part of a history assignment. Sendler was a Polish Catholic, and her surgeon father raised her to think of the Jewish people as equals. And when the Nazis invaded in 1939, she was working as an administrator in the Warsaw Social Welfare Department where homeless people and orphans were provided with food and shelter. Sendler immediately decided on her own to initiate, to begin a covert mission to supply food, medicine, and money to any Jews in need of them. She knew this would be illegal under Nazi rules, so she signed the Jews up under Christian names to keep the authorities away. She told them that anyone who was signed up to receive aid had highly infectious typhus while the Jews lived under false identity, Sendler kept their real ones in jars, buried under an apple tree in her neighbor's yard. Once the Warsaw Ghetto was established, the Jews inside began dying at a rate of 5,000 per month from starvation and disease. Sendler entered the ghetto daily, disguised as a nurse, convincing Jewish parents to let her smuggle their children to safety. She's credited with personally saving the lives of 2,500 children. Spiriting them out of the ghetto under false names and giving them to adoptive parents, orphanages, and convents. She hid some in wheelbarrows full of clothes or food and gave one infant to a man to smuggle out in his toolbox. Others were taken out hidden in coffins and burlap potato sacks. In October 20, 1943, the Gestapo finally figured out what Irena was up to and arrested her. They smashed her feet and legs until all the bones were broken. But she refused to divulge any names. They sentenced her to death. But her friends bribed one of the guards to let her go. And she spent the rest of her of the war in hiding. And afterwards, she dug up the jars. And a year before her death, Irena was nominated for the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize, of which Al Gore won. She couldn't walk because of what the Nazis did to her. Let's go to the next one. Stefania Podgorska. Podgorska was born in a small village in southeastern Poland in 1923. When she was 14, she moved to a nearby town of Przemysl and took a job working for a local family of Jewish grocers. And when the Nazis invaded, her mother and brother were sent to a German labor camp, and Stef 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 Stefania's employers were confined to the ghetto, leaving her to care for her six-year-old sister. Then in 1942, the Nazis began liquidating the ghetto, and Joe Diamant, the, stun, the son of uh, Stefania's grocer boss before the war was sent to a camp, but managed to escape by leaping from a moving train. Alone and desperate, Joe found his way to Stefania, who agreed to hide him in her attic, and Joe managed to get in touch with his remaining family, and a number of Jews escaped the ghetto and took shelter in Podgorska's, uh, with the Podgorska sisters. Stefania had to move to a nearby two-bedroom cottage to accommodate them all, there were eventually 13 Jews concealed with the Bogorskas, and Joe fashioned a makeshift false wall in the attic to hide them. Two years later, the Germans took over 
a building across the street and converted it into a hospital and then started taking over apartments in the neighborhood. A German officer knocked on the, their door and told the Podorsk, uh, Podgorskas that they had to leave within two hours. And the Jews hiding with them urged them to go and save themselves, vowing not to be taken without a fight. After praying, however, Stephania claimed to have heard a woman's voice urging her not to go. And her mind made up. Stephania decided to stay even though she knew this, risk her, this would risk her own life and that of her sister. And when the officer returned, he cheerfully told Stephania that he would only need one room after all and that she could carry on living in the other one. The officer stayed for seven months, completely unaware that 13 Jews were hiding just above his head. She... In 1944, after they were liberated the next year, she ended up marrying Joe the grocer. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. Next slide. That's it. I thought there was more. There will be for the next service. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, the picture that we have here that's so important is that truly we are distributors, not manufacturers. And it's the power of one. And whatever you have, listen to the words of Jesus. Whatever you have. And you know what you're called to. And apathy and complacency is not the call of the Christian. There's no faith in that. Jesus says to you today and to me, bring them here to me. I will manufacture and distribute it, and I will use you. Such a profound event that every gospel writer included it. And you know who was most blown away? The little boy. He was tired that day too. But he got to see the miracle of all of it. Because he brought what he had to Jesus. I think of us in our lives. We get to a place where we're complacent and we just don't want to do it anymore. But Jesus gave thanks. And I'll leave you with this last thought. No doubt you're tired. And some of you may not be tired enough. Or you're tired of the wrong things. You're tired that God's not dancing to your drumbeat. That's a whole nother issue. You got to fight with God. I just, I can tell you this, you're not going to win. <laughs> you don't really like the ministry he's called you to. He'll change that. He has that way. The thing about Jesus is, yeah, he lost his dear relative and his friend. His heart was broken and he was tired. And he actually, the scriptures say in the other account of one of the gospels, he needed to get away. And he is, he's seeing the crowd just move as a horde to the shore and he's getting ready to come in and he knows what's awaiting him. But the part that blows me away is the scripture says he was moved with compassion for them. For many of us prior to knowing the Lord, the only person we have compassion for is ourselves. Jesus said, you want to be great in his kingdom, you're a servant of all, even the difficult ones. And the ones that write you nasty emails and hit to the core of your heart for your family. The ones who devastate you by deception and leave a mess that they expect you to clean up. And there are those days you just want to get on a boat. But you come back for one simple reason. The Spirit of the Lord is inside you and he's moved you with compassion. You know what compassion is? Compassion costs you something. Oh, no, 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 no. It's not a little dollar to somebody on the street corner with a sign. That's not compassion. What does that cost you? Compassion is getting out of the car and knowing what are we dealing with here? 
Compassion is making a difference in the problem. Compassion is stepping forward. Compassion is being exhausted. Not throwing money out of a window and feeling like you've done your due diligence. Compassion is the end of the day where you are so worn out and everyone else is gluttoned and you are exhausted, but your heart is full because you know you're right where God wants you, doing exactly what he's called you to do. That's compassion. The rest is apathy and complacency. The world needs people like the ones we just saw. Because the world lost Harry Grotty. And I'm looking for another one. Somebody who would pray for me every day, pray for my family by name, and tell me every time I saw him he loved me. And you could see it in his eyes that every word he said was true. And you watched it by his actions every day. And don't expect me to be at your bedside when you die. And then tell me that my love for you isn't unconditional because I missed this important occasion. That had never even crossed his mind. Because your heart is right where God wants you to be. And I think as a congregation, we are, we are so blessed. I mean, I look around the room and I see so many like Harry. People that just, you can't even give them stuff because they don't even want it. They just want to help. And the sacrificial giving of, of the congregation is just, it blows my mind. And I was so touched by the story and the timing of it. And it ministered to me deeply. And I, I just love what I do. I love it. And the trip was great, but I'm happy to be home. And it's amazing how the Lord restores your heart for the ministry the minute you hit the shore. And that's all I got to say about that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for Harry. Lord, I pray for Gretchen and for Mo. I pray for those that need to know the truth, that the truth would set them free. And we're contending for ideologies, whether it be we're going to be governed by God or governed by another of a, of a different kind. And how do we... How do we step into this world, speak the truth in love, have that balance, be insulted and yet still have a love to realize people aren't the enemy, they're the opportunity and to watch guys like R.C. Chapman and never build a bitterness but just step forward continually and not be exhausted like Jesus, that we wouldn't be burned out in the ministry, that we may be exhausted physically but our hearts are full. Lord, only you can do that and unless we bring all this to you, we're gonna burn out whatever we have, we bring it to you. Just like that little boy, the power of one. That little boy was a nut dancing in the wilderness. And the disciples came along and made it a movement and fed 15,000 people as they distributed. And Lord, you manufactured. And your storehouses are full. You're just waiting for people to take the bread to the hungry. And so, Lord, I pray that you would continue to minister to us and cause us to abide in you, that we would truly be servants, that even if our birthdays are forgotten or our death is overlooked, we're not embittered because we've been called and given a supernatural love for the people we've been called to serve. And the Spirit of the living God has given us compassion, that we would love those folks as that they're our own family. And so, Lord, thank you. We love you, we praise you, and Lord, be blessed in this time of worship. And I, I ask, Lord, as we spend time in prayer right now, that we would pray this in, we wouldn't just hear this message, be touched maybe, and then leave and forget what we heard, but we would come and we would bring it to the altar and we would pray it in deeply and say, Lord, let it, let it be me to be that servant. Lord, I wanna bring it to you, to the altar. And so, God, I just commit all this time to you. I pray for a profound move of ministry right now in the hearts of your people. 
Spirit of living God, fall afresh on us. Let this time of prayer be profound. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.